James O. Davis was born in Lima, Ohio on March 25, 1924. His parents were Eva Stein and Lee Davis. Eva is a descendant of George Stetler, who served in the Revolutionary War from 1781 to 1782. George moved his family from Berks County, Pennsylvania in 1804, settling near what is now Miamisburg, Ohio. Jim grew up in a house located at 1205 Feeman Avenue in Lima. He grew up and shared the house with four other siblings, his older sister Jean, and younger brothers Jack and Dan, and sister Sally. Jim graduated from St. Rose High School in 1942. He served as the senior class president. Jim worked briefly as a clerk at the Lima Locomotive Works. The Lima Locomotive Works was one of the nation's largest steam locomotive builders, building more than 7,000 locomotives from 1879 to 1951. During World War II, they built over 1,800 Sherman M4 tanks that first appeared in Europe and North Africa in 1942. Jim answered his nation's call to arms and enlisted in the Army on February 9, 1943 in Toledo, Ohio. Jim received his basic training at Fort Riley, Kansas. Fort Riley also trained several notable celebrities. Boxer Joe Lewis, actor Mickey Rooney, and baseball great Jackie Robinson. Jim was deployed to England in late March 1944. Many different ships were used to transport the massive number of troops overseas. The largest and fastest of the ships was the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary could carry 16,000 troops and make the Atlantic crossing in six days. Other ships, such as the SS Santa Rosa and the Santa Maria, were much smaller and slower, requiring 13 days to make the trip. The records of the ships used to carry the troops were destroyed intentionally in 1951. According to the National Archive records, in 1951 the Department of the Army destroyed all passenger lists, manifests, logs of vessels, and troop movement files of the United States Army transports for World War II. There's no word on why the records were destroyed, so we just don't know who sailed on what ship. For three months, Jim and his unit, the 90th Reconnaissance Group, prepared for what would be the start of the campaign to free Europe from the Nazis. A period of intensive training followed, consisting of mine detection, village fighting, assault on fortified positions, hedgerow fighting, artillery firing problems, road marches, and obstacle courses. The rough edges were polished off and coordination between units became more than a word more than a goal, but an accomplished fact. The 90th Reconnaissance Troop was part of the 90th Infantry Division. What is the mission of a recon unit? That is perhaps answered best by one of the Army training manuals. It says, the principal mission of all reconnaissance agencies is to obtain information required by higher authority and get it to the interested party in time to be useful. While it is highly desirable to obtain information without being detected, time is the important factor. The reconnaissance platoon and company must therefore be prepared at all times to act both intelligently and aggressively. A recon unit would be sent out ahead of the main body of a division. Their job was to probe and identify enemy strength, composition, and direction of travel. Reconnaissance work requires that individuals know and utilize many different things, like setting up a radio net, being proficient with the use of codes and ciphers, as to not let the enemy know exactly what they are reporting, be proficient with navigation, making maps and illustrations, being able to identify armored vehicles either through direct observation or through the tracks left behind in the dirt, or their sounds at a distance, and being able to assess the load capacity of roads and bridges so that commanders could plan in their advance. While their goal is to see and gather information without being seen, it should be noted that this was seldom possible. 
A reconnaissance platoon must always be prepared to attack vigorously and to accomplish its mission. The 359th Infantry led the way for the 90th Infantry Division landing on Utah Beach on June 6, 1944, D-Day. The Allies had landed around 156,000 troops the first day under intense and devastating fire from the German Army. By June 8th, the remainder of the 90th Division arrived at Utah Beach and began debarkation at noon. The 90th Infantry Division was born in the soil of Texas, proudly at Camp Berkeley on March 25, 1942. The division started out as young and eager, and they grew more confident with each day of training. Members on their left sleeve wore an olive drab patch with the red inscription T.O. The letters once stood for Texas and Oklahoma, because originally the division was made up almost exclusively of men from those two states. Later, however, as the division drew its men from every corner of every state in the nation, the battle-hardened T.O. came to represent, by common consent, tough hombres. The division assembled near Turkville, and its first command post in France was established at Luther. On the evening of June 8th, the 90th received their first orders. The 90th will attack at 0400 hours on June 10th. This was what the long months of training were for. The marching and the crawling, the endless repetition, harping on details. School days had ended, and now began the final examinations. No more after-problem critiques, except where mistakes were written in blood and errors in judgment were entered on the casualty lists. Thrusting their way forward quickly, the 357th and 358th regiments forced their crossings of the Murderay River with the towns of Amfreville and pont la abbe the immediate objectives. But the enemy was prepared. For four years they had anticipated landings in France, and for four years they had perfected their defenses, building a wall of steel to repel the might of the invaders. This, then, was the test an irresistible force versus an immovable object. The hedgerows of Normandy were designed by the French to conserve the soil and prevent erosion, but the Germans utilized them for other purposes. The hedgerows of France made ideal lines of defense. You could place a strong force of defenders behind one row and cover the approaches with murderous fire from small arms. At each end of the row, properly placed machine guns could sweep the field before them with deadly crossfire. And suppose somehow the Americans succeeded in neutralizing the defenses of row number one. In that case, row number two would go into action with mortars zeroed in on the fields. Mortars that burst without warning, spreading fragments and death. And to round it off neatly, Row number three was well defended with other artillery of assorted calibers and all possible targets within range duly noted and accurately plotted. It was an ingenious plan of defense, simple and effective. If the attacking troops succeeded in taking one row of hedges, there were miles of additional rows upon which the Germans could fall back. Advances, if they were made at all, would be costly so costly, in fact, that the Germans believed that the Americans would lose heart and eventually retire to the shores of England, smarting under the bloodiest defeat in military history. The men of the 90th Division, pushing forward inch by inch and yard by yard, clinging desperately to whatever gains they could win, lashing at their enemy with guns and knives and stones and fists and sheer unadulterated guts, can testify to that. The German plan was a good one, but it had one flaw. It did not work. The Americans had no intention of returning to England. Their course led straight through the hedgerows, out across the plains of France, and into Hitler's own backyard. The hedgerows slowed the 90th's attack, but each day saw new gains scored. Slowly but surely, from row to row, the veteran units of the mighty German army fell back because of the American troops with the T.O. patch on their sleeve. Weeks went by, and the 90th I.D. pushed forward. First, there was Gorbazville, Cherbourg. They would fall. The pattern was repeated over and over again. 
artillery pulverized the contested areas. The recon units surveyed the area, the infantry moved forward, the engineers cleared the roads of mines and booby traps. Again the artillery, again the reconnaissance, again the infantry, again the engineers, again and again. And slowly the gains were made, slowly, but with tragic losses. Hill 122 was especially brutal. The 400-foot rise had been used by Caesar's army in 56 BC in the battle with the Gauls. The Germans had dug themselves in on Hitler's orders to stop the American advance to the south. They called it the Malmann Line, and it was defended by an elite regiment of the German army. The six-day battle from July 3rd to the 9th cost the 90th Division 5,000 casualties. On August 4th, the 90th Infantry Division received orders from General Patton. The 90th was to push south and east without delay into the city of Le Mans. At this point, the 90th was being commanded by Generals McLean and Weaver. Le Mans was some 90 miles behind German lines, and they knew their mission would be difficult. If the attack had started with the entire division, it may not have been so successful because they would have lacked the necessary mobility and would have given the Germans additional time to organize their defenses. If a regimental combat team had been used, it would have lacked the necessary firepower to reduce the existing German defenses. A decision was made to form a task force. This task force became the famous Task Force Weaver, and their accomplishment is still being studied today. Over four days from August 5th through the 9th, Task Force Weaver would push through 90 miles of enemy-held territory. They made a river crossing, captured the large city of Mayan by street fighting tactics, established a bridgehead, fought a meaningful engagement with superior enemy force in the vicinity of Aron, and they made two successful night withdrawals to deceive the enemy and fight five numerous small engagements. Their advance was continuous and speedy, and any captured position was considered just another line of departure. The principles of mass and surprise are very prominent in this operation. Years later, Task Force Weaver's actions were analyzed by Major Francis S. Kelly. His conclusion was that reconnaissance was continuous and so thorough that, in my opinion, it was the deciding factor in the success of the operation. That success came as the main losses in the operation were the reconnaissance troop and the tank battalion. It was here near Le Mans, France, that technician 5th class James O. Davis of the 90th reconnaissance troop was killed on August 9, 1944. He was just 20 years old. His family was posthumously awarded the Purple Heart. On the day he was killed, the French city of Le Mans was liberated by Task Force Weaver. James Davis is buried at the Brittany American Cemetery, 70 miles southwest of Normandy, near the town of St. James, France. Brittany is one of 24 cemeteries in 10 countries maintained by the American Battle Monuments Commission. Near the entrance is a Romanesque-style chapel with a sculpture at its base that symbolizes the triumph of youth over evil. 
Inside the chapel is a map made up of aggregates of colored glass with insets of brass lettering depicting the path the Allies took after the landing. Several stained glass windows are present. along with some simple prayers inscribed on a granite wall. At this cemetery rests 4,410 Americans. All were soldiers except for two. Thomas S. Trainer, a war correspondent with the Los Angeles Times, and John W. Schwer, the chaplain assigned to the 6th Armored Division. Two Medal of Honor recipients are here, Staff Sergeant Sherwood H. Hallman and Private First Class Ernest W. Prussman. There are also remains of 97 unknown soldiers who could not be positively identified. In two of these graves rest the remains of two unknowns who could not be separately identified. Also buried here are 20 sets of brothers who are interred side by side, along with an uncle and his nephew. There are also close friends, two from California and two from Massachusetts who were buried side by side. When you arrive at the cemetery, your first stop is at the visitor center. Here, a staff member can help you locate a particular grave. The staff member finds the location of the plot then carries a small pail of moistened sand and an American flag to the site. The flag is placed adjacent to the marble cross. Sand taken from the Normandy beach is then placed in the inlaid inscription to make it more visible. This Memorial Day, let's remember James Davis and all the brave American heroes who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, may you let these servants pass directly into heaven, for their courage and devotion to duty cannot be questioned. They have stood against evil, and they have won.